Larry, let's start with what an official spokesman for Turkey's ruling party was talking about. He said that terrorist attack, these terrorists could not have carried out the crocus attack without the support of foreign intelligence services. At the same time, we have reports from New York Times that talking about that the U.S. intel agencies didn't hand Moscow all data they had. It seems that the Israeli intelligence knew something about these activities. What's your take on the latest information on this terrorist attack? Well, you always start with the, this information would not be out there unless there was intelligence. And so the intelligence comes from one of two sources. Either you've got a, a human being who is familiar with the planning or who's involved with the planning for a terrorist act who has been recruited to give up information and does so to either the CIA or it may well have been in this case to the Israelis. And then the Israelis passed it to the United States. And then the United States acted on it. So first is the human source. Or alternatively, you could have a, an intercepted communication, uh, intercept of a telephone call, intercept of an email, of a text message, something like that, in which these details are communicated. Now, and it's not, it's not one or the other. <laughs> you could have had both. So when the United States, so I don't know if the United States got this on its own or got it from a liaison, you know, liaison services, a foreign service uh, from, you know, the service from intelligence service from another country that shares its information with you. Um, I'm beginning to suspect, based upon this latest article, that the United States got it from the Israelis. And the, the, it was credible and it had some specifics. How do we know it had specifics? Because when the U.S. Embassy released that warning, they, spe they specified 48 hours. So from the time that it was announced to the public, count 48 hours, basically two days. So it was released on a Friday, Sunday. You get past Sunday, then phew, well, we avoided the attack. I was... You know, I was. I think we talked about this on Monday a little bit. I was there at the beginning of the whole debate and the policy decision on what to do and when do you warn the public? And because back in 1989, it was 10, 11 months since the bombing of Panama 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland. And there was a lot of public uproar and concern that the U.S. government had advanced knowledge of this terrorist attack and didn't warn the public that we the, the we the government had told CIA and state department personnel oh, don't get on that plane it's going to blow up and and so we had to come up with a policy to both reassure the public that if there was credible intelligence and the attack could not be prevented then we would go public with a warning now, the key word there is cannot be prevented. If you've got, if, if I, and I've never seen intelligence like this, but let's just assume that they had intelligence that said on either Saturday, March 8th, or, Mar or Sunday, March 9th, uh, four, four to six terrorists who come from Tajikistan are going to launch uh, an assault on the Crocus City Center. Boy, that's pretty specific. Now, it doesn't tell you what time, but it tells you how many and where. So at, at that point, would you go out and warn the public? Well, probably not, because you could put out enough security personnel and you could you know what they're looking for. So that the high likelihood that you could prevent it, you wouldn't need to go warn. Uh, so clearly, the United States did not share any kind of information like that with the Russians. Because if they had, and it had been that specific, there wouldn't have been the public warning. The really odd thing is this. It was specified for 48 hours. So when we get to the end of that 48-hour period, nothing's happened. What do you conclude? Was it bullshit intelligence? You know, not credible, false? Or the security measures that were taken 
Did that prevent the attack? You don't know. But at that point, the intelligence community in the United States, and in Russia for that matter, needed to make an assessment. Uh, I can see the Russians saying, the United States is just playing us. This, this isn't real. We've, we've, we've got our fingers on the pulse of uh, different terrorist factions here. <clears throat> so we think whatever they thought was going to happen isn't going to happen. Um, but it, it, it could have been that, uh, you know, the United States still believed, well, it didn't happen on Sunday, but it could still happen sometime going forward. So at that point, the U S embassy in Moscow and state and main state had the obligation to go warn the public again, say, Hey, following up on our advisory issued on March 7th, we need to extend the alert for American citizens in Moscow to avoid large gatherings, including concerts and, and, and shopping centers, malls. They didn't do that. But then they leaked these articles to both the New York Times and, and then this intelligence official goes, talks to Seymour Hersh. So unfortunately, he got Cy putting out the same crap as the New York Times. And it's saying that, oh, we we told the Rus we told the Russians because we we have a, a duty uh, to uh, to inform, that, which is and they said that that started in 2015. It didn't start in 2015. It started in 1989. Uh, so it started like 35, you know, from 2015. 2015 uh, it started, uh, you know, was it 20, 35 years, 36 years. Uh, so th this is, and and within that duty to warn, there was the notion that if you had credible intelligence and you could prevent the terrorist attack, you would share it with the host government without necessarily revealing it to the public. But what we're told in this is that the CIA held back details. Well, maybe those were critical details that could have prevented what happened on the 22nd of March. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And the, the, the line that goes on from people like uh, John Kirby and this Matthew Miller at State Department is disgraceful and it's shameful. But um, they're now playing the game of trying to blame Russia for not stopping an attack on the 22nd that, according to what the U.S. government released, was going to happen on... Uh, March 9th or before. So when it comes to the Putin's take on this terrorist attack, he says that the West is trying to break up multinational Russia. What does he mean when he says that? Well, what they're trying to do is foster animus towards the Muslim population. And what, what I find fast, you know, what fascinates me about Russia is there are 190 different ethnic groups. And uh, from, you know, you get to the Chechens, the Ossetians, the Ingushins, the Tajiks, the Uzbeks, you know, you go, uh, uh, well, what used to be, even though Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan are, are all separate countries, now there are still ethnic populations from those countries inside the boundaries of Russia. Uh, you have You have Muslims, you have Hindus. You know, it's quite a mix. And I, I have no doubt that with respect to the CIA and British MI6, that they have uh, been working covert plans, covert action plans, to try to foster, sow ethnic animosity in Russia in a bid to break Russia up, to cause Russia to split up, uh, to create an internal civil war if possible. This, uh, it's just, it's insane. But, um, and I think that this this attack, which was, uh, I'm sure, originated out of Ukraine, but had the assistance of both British and American intelligence officers. But, but the goal was to try to create an incident that would discredit Vladimir Putin, call into question the competence of these uh, 
both the uh, FSB and uh, the internal security, uh, the SVR. Uh, and so animus, where the, the, the regular, let's call it conventional Eastern Orthodox Christian population would be filled with hatred towards the Muslim por portion because these guys were you know, ostensibly Muslim. The economists reported that Russia is preparing for a new big offensive in the summer. Do they have any sort of information that it's going to happen or they're speculating on this offensive? Well, they're speculating. Um, if, if you're watching what's going on right now, I think the offensive has already started. You know, they're, they're moving. Uh, they're not just moving along a 10-mile front or a 20-mile front. I mean, they're, they're moving along around 600 miles. And they keep moving forward. Um, there is one tactic that they have not employed that uh, I would think that they would do at some point. But if they blew up every bridge over the Dnieper River, that would uh, that would cut off the entire Ukrainian army that's east of the Dnieper River from supplies. They would die on the vine immediately or within a week or two. Uh, so I'm sort of curious or, would you know, I'd love to sit down with Shoigu or Garasimov and ask him, well, why haven't you done this? And they may have a very good reason. They want to keep the bridges intact for themselves because they have, their plan is to uh, force the Ukrainians out and then move across the river uh, to the uh, west bank uh, of the Dnieper. You know, maybe that's it. Um, so it, it's just... Uh, the, the the Russians may ex intensify the war, but I don't see them necessarily dramatically expanding it. What, what we do know for sure, unlike the Ukrainians and the Americans and the Brits, remember a year ago? Oh, the, the offensive's coming up. We're going to launch the offensive. Uh, we're we're, we're, we're going to be, it's going to be early spring. No, it's going to be early, uh, late spring. No, it may be early summer. We're, but we're coming. We're going to launch the expansion. They kept talking about it. Do you hear the Russians talking about it? No. It's Bloomberg talking about it. So the Russians may be putting out um, false signals. Uh, you know, they're, it's called Maskerovka. Uh, the the Russians are notorious for that historically, uh, putting out fake information or getting people to believe one thing where they're going to do another. So um, right now, in spite of it being what they call the Raputisa, this you know big mud bath that uh, the Rasputitsa, I guess it is, um, Russians are still moving forward in spite of that. And yet you see a lot of, uh, you know, Challenger tank. There's that one video where the tank was stuck in the mud, couldn't get out. They had to go find some other tank to try to pull it out. It just a mess. But, you know, the Ukrainian troops are, are steadily falling back. They're not advancing. Did you see these two articles that Forbes reported last year and this year? Yeah, <laughs> Challenger. <laughs> yeah David Axe, you know. I thought it, I thought it was initially I thought it was looking at an advertisement for body soap. You know, they got that Axe, you know, deodorant and Axe body soap. And then I realized, oh no, it's the Forbes reporter. And hey, he said it initially. Oh yeah, the Challenger tank boy, it's going to roll right through the Russians. Well, that didn't work out so well. And so now I realize, too big, too slow, too cumbersome. Too you know, the nothing good about it. Uh, except for the defense industry that made it and got paid. That was good for them. But everyone else is going, oh, my God. I saw that you together with Ray Scott and other friends of this show, the Weatherance Intelligence Professional for Sanity, you wrote this piece on the consortium news warning Joe Biden <clears throat> of the French well, road to nuclear war. Now, l let's be clear, though, about one thing. I did not write it. Scott did. So Scott Ritter, you know, let's let's give Scott the credit. I, uh, I'd love to. Yes, that was my piece. I wrote it. Wasn't it brilliant? <laughs> Ray told me that Scott wrote the draft of this article. 
But yeah. I want your take on this article because it's so important, the French road to nuclear war and the behavior, the strange behavior that we have been witnessing from Emmanuel Macron. Yeah. Uh, number one, you know, Macron apparently is not a student of history. He didn't study anything about Napoleon. And because if he would consult Napoleon about Napoleon's suggestions of, hey, Napoleon, is it a good idea to invade Russia? Oh, no, no, mon dieu, no, you know, <laughs> of course not. Uh, that nightmarish retreat from Moscow after, you know, the city was set on fire and then you know, the Russian army regrouped and just how did it chase them across the country and back into uh, Germany or Poland? Uh, it, was, it was a nightmare. The, how much of the, uh, they're lucky they didn't lose more than they did. So here's. Here's Macron wanting to repeat that history. It is, uh, it's absurd. And, 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 you know, he's talking about that now, but France is going to host the Olympics. I don't see Macron wanting to put himself in the position of being the host of the Olympics while he's got French troops dying in Ukraine because he was stupid enough to send him there. I don't see that happening. May, I could be wrong. But uh, this was, I think, his clumsy effort at trying to reassert French leadership. You know, we are, we're the leaders of Europe. <clears throat> and it, I think it's sort of blown up on him, backfired. Again, mm -hmm. they're talking about sending Taurus missile and F-16s to Ukraine. Both of them are capable of carrying nuclear bombs. That's the key. That is the key fact right there, my friend. Do you see the Biden administration willing to send these weapons to Ukraine? Oh, well, no, I, they'll, they'll send them probably to Poland and to Romania and try to operate out of airfields there. And you saw that Putin said the other day, uh, in these aircraft, they show up. We have to assume that they're carrying nukes. We can't afford to trust the Americans because the Americans are not trustworthy. So they're, they're, we're assuming they're carrying nukes. We got to destroy them. And that's what they'll do. They'll destroy them. And if they're hiding out in Romania and Poland, they'll destroy them in Romania and Poland, which then will raise the interesting question of now this is an attack on a NATO member in their country. And so does this justify uh, enacting Article 5? Well, that means the Poles would, uh, the Polish government would have to vote on it. Now, you saw that just, I, I guess, just today, I don't know if you ever follow uh, Anya Anya K. Uh, she she does some uh, podcasts. Um, she uh, is in Poland, and she said that they they passed a new uh, mandatory conscription law, so they're going to be uh, for two hundred thousand two hundred thirty thousand. So two hundred thirty thousand poles between the ages of uh, eighteen and sixty are going to be compelled to sign up in the military because they're building up and they're building up to prepare to fight Russia. Uh, it's crazy, but, you know, if they if they allow those F-16s to come into the country, Russia's going to hit them. But there, there is a problem in Poland. The majority of the people don't support going to war with Russia. So, you know, we'll have to see. This, this is... Uh, you know, this is a, we're entering a very, very dangerous time is, I guess, what I'd say. And that was the message that conveyed in that the VIPs memo uh, that we all signed on to and that uh, Scott did such a great job of drafting. So uh, trying to, you know, wake the president up and anybody else will read it. Th this is not worth the threat. This is not worth the danger. The other thing that Putin said that Russia is not going to fight with NATO. Well, I think he's trying to combat the narrative that the West is promoting. That uh, Russia is an imperial power intent on conquering all of Europe. And that Putin wants to reinvent the Soviet Union. You know, the it's just it's foolishness like that. So I think he's trying to, you know, uh, allay f fears that that's you know, what Russia's intention. Now, that said, um, if Poland and Romania deploy F-16s on their territory that are then used for military operations in Ukraine, 
Poland and Romania are going to get hit. Now it raises the question of, is NATO going to declare war on Russia? That's what it would come down to. Um, and if they do declare war on Russia, then every single military installation in Europe could be a target for Russia. And Russia has far more capability with its missiles to hit and take those out, and including in the United States. The United States will not get off scot-free. So this is, you know, the, again, Macron is playing a very dangerous game. The, the good news, though, is he, he's not getting uh, great support, both in France and especially from the military leadership in France. Uh, they're getting pushback, as well as from other Europeans and even from the United States. So hopefully, with uh, you know, we'll avoid th this particular escalation anyway. I don't know if you saw this article in Bloomberg criticizing Macron for his position on sending these troops to Ukraine and fighting Russians. If Poland do the same, do you think that the United States is willing or capable of controlling these countries? I think the, the United States has limited control over what these countries uh, are, are doing or, or decide to do. Uh, and let's not forget that the United States is reportedly at odds, at least uh, the Biden administration is reportedly at odds with the government of Rishi Sunak in, in the United Kingdom because the Brits are encouraging the Ukrainians to carry out what are were described in that one tweet from the o o o open source intelligence defender uh, tweet of, from a week ago uh, that uh, said Un uh, unwarranted brazen acts. Or, or unauthorized brazen acts. So Britain's been involved with those unauthorized brazen acts, particularly attacks on oil uh, pumping sites, oil petroleum, and try and disrupt, trying to disrupt the flow of oil out of Russia. Well, if you reduce the supply of oil from Russia, which is one of the world's major suppliers, you know, you're good enough at basic economics. If you got to reduce supply of something, what does that do to the price? What makes the price go up? There's still this great demand for it, but there's less of it. So people have to pay more uh, to get some of it. And that's the last thing the Bidens want during a, a, an election campaign. Uh, you know, there was a lot of speculation over the last three months in the United States that Biden would resign and some other magical candidate, uh, you know, Michelle Obama, magic, you know, the magic of her uh, as if that would save uh, the Democrats. But I, I think Biden's keen on, as long as he's breathing, he's going to hang on to that job. He, he likes it. He, you know, it uh, feeds his ego. Uh, but, um, and so for that reason, he doesn't want the price of oil to go up. And so they're pushing Ukraine back. Hey, stop that. You know, stop those attacks. Uh, it's, a, it's a mess. The policy is a mess. It's, it's hostage right now to a domestic election. There is a conference in Switzerland talking about Ukraine and the peace in Ukraine. And it seems that Russia doesn't intend to take part in this conference. Right. And... If Russia is not part of this conference, what they're going to discuss in this conference? They, they, they might as well meet to discuss uh, and answer the question, is there life on Saturn? Or is there life on Mars? And, uh, you know, how many space colonies can you fit on this, you know, the southern tip of uh, the planet Mars? You know, it's ridiculous talk. It's not based in reality. Uh, they're not going to... You know, you've got to have Russia at the table and take into account Russia's interests if you're hoping to get a peaceful settlement. Now, all of that rests on the assumption that Russia is going to be uh, amenable to going along with that. Last I checked, the Russians are getting each passing day. They're growing more and more pissed off, grumpy. Eh, no, 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 no. We're not, we don't have anything to talk about. Other than you surrender, that that's about the extent of the discussion with Ukraine. Zelensky, get out, disband the Azov battalion, 
we'll take back Odessa and Kharkiv, and then uh, we'll stop killing you guys. Otherwise, we're going to keep killing you. When Trump was in office, you remember he was calling the North Korean leader, this is a rocket man. And yeah. when Biden took office, everybody was criticizing Trump for the way he was behaving in those days. But when Biden took office in his first interview with CNN, the interviewer asked Biden, do you consider Putin as a child killer? He said, yes, he is. Just two days ago, he called Putin a butcher. Yeah, and he's a but butcher. And don't forget Xi Jinping. He's a dictator. Dictator, Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Larry, do do is there any sort of policy behind this kind of name calling leaders? Because it doesn't make sense if you want to negotiate, if you want to have some sort of cooperation, compromise with these countries. Now, again, Nima, that's your problem. This is your great weakness. You're too logical. You're too, you know, you're trying to be thoughtful. <laughs> these guys aren't logical. They're crazy. I mean, once people step back and realize there is not um, some great master plan at work in the Biden administration, they're making it up as they go along. Biden is bat shit crazy. And I know that's not a technical term, but that sort of summarizes it. And just calling, you know, calling the leaders these names, you know, they would go after Trump for calling people like uh, uh, Marco, Senator Marco, of Florida, uh, Marco Rubio, tiny Marco, little little Marco, and uh, you know, and then and the media go, oh, how dare he! Meanwhile, Biden saying far worse things about foreign leaders, where it can really be consequential, can really have a deleterious effect on America's national security, America's, the welfare of Americans overseas. And he's oblivious to it. He's just that nasty old man that uh, losing his marbles. I don't know if you ever lived on a street where you had one of those, you know, some nasty old guy that'd be out yelling, to get off my lawn. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's detrimental. It, you know, it, it really hurts the U.S. credibility. That we're we've never seen a time since the end of World War II where uh, the United States is as weak as it is, is as disrespected globally as it is today, and all that's uh, thanks to the work of Joe Biden. When you look at Joe Biden's behavior and compare it to JFK, it's not comparable because they had the same kind of problems, but he was, his manner was totally different from what we've seen so far. Well, remember, uh, Kennedy was 40 years younger than uh, when he was president than Biden is now that Biden's president. I mean, remember, Kennedy was like 42, and here's Biden, 82. So, you know, Kennedy back then still had at least the brain of a young man and good, uh, you know, and, and had a good, a good sense of humor. Uh, had some terrible policies, but had a good sense of humor and knew how to deflect attacks and criticism. Not not Biden. Biden is a thin skinned, nasty old man. That's, that's no other way to characterize it. We've learned that the new president of Senegal is asking France to leave. This is part of this strange behavior of Macron. What the hell right do the French have to be there anyway? It's not their territory. They weren't born there. They're not natives. It's, it's just an extension of their colonial past. Where they, they used to get go down there and all, all the black people had to work for them as servants. You know, would run around, step and fetch it. You know the old characters and uh, was that, that name us and Andy uh, radio programs back here, but it, it's, it's racist. It's fundamentally racist, and uh, of course I know with some irony the uh, the people from Africa are returning the favor to Paris because they've been, it flooded the streets of Paris with homeless. Uh, I mean, it's just it's a disaster, a complete nightmare. 
William that Houthis are warning Saudi Arabia of retaliation if Saudis support U.S. strikes on them. Do you see the Saudis changing their policy toward this operation in the Red Sea? No, no, I don't. <clears throat> um, I, I don't think the Saudis, the, the Saudis recognize that the United States is a loser of a country right now. The United States is not in in a position of growing power and influence, unlike Russia and China. So, and and the Saudis having developed a better relationship recently with uh, the Chinese and the Russians, I don't think we're going to put that in danger just in order to placate the United States. And they certainly, and they certainly don't want to be in the position of, you know, touching off a new battle with the Houthis without having the, the full attention confidence that they'd have the full attention and support of the United States. I mean, that I think that's in real question because the United States is preoccupied with Ukraine and with uh, Gaza and with the Houthis. They don't have uh, room to do, you know, it's sort of like their dance card is full. The other thing that has happened that Israelis are attacking Syria again. Maria Zakharova said that these attacks are going to have dangerous consequences for Israel. What's the reason behind these attacks in Syria? Well, they, I mean, they've made it clear that they're going to go into southern Lebanon and take on Hezbollah. And Hezbollah has some support networks there in that part of Syria uh, and up through Aleppo. And, uh, you know, I think Zakharova is, is right. There, there are going to be some terrible consequences to pay. Uh, Gallant apparently informed reporters that the reason he was in Washington this last week visiting with Secretary Austin and the White House, talking about the upcoming Israeli invasion of southern Lebanon. They're going to do it. And Israel, I believe, will, will be uh, soundly defeated. They will be... They, they will they will experience a military loss that will put them in fear of losing Israel as in a, as a whole. How do you see right now the relationship between the Biden administration and the Netanyahu administration? Because we have Israelis in the United States negotiating with the <clears throat> Biden administration, considering the conflict, these differences, these disagreements between two the two administrations. What's I think I, I think I, I, th I think some of that's for political theater. Uh, because look at the actual effect. Biden critics or has you know the they abstain from uh, the, vetoing the bill at the, uh, the resolution at the Security Council the other day. Chuck Schumer goes out and says Netanyahu ought to be replaced. Well, who's that message played to? Well, that plays to the Arab American, Muslim American, uh, that in the past would be counted on to support the Democrats, but now no longer. They're furious with genocide, Joe, you got to go. You know, that chant is heard uh, quite a bit. So now Biden administration is making the turn. Oh, yeah, we're, we're, we, we're against Israel. We want to get rid of this Netanyahu. Oh, okay. And, yeah, we're just, you know, we're going to uh, continue to, we're going to abstain so, yeah, there should be a ceasefire. And then the United States spends the rest of the subsequent time saying, but it's not mandatory, you know. So what happened when they attacked Netanyahu? He got more popular in Israel, not less, more. It, it boosted his popularity. Now, now he gets to play the United States off as this bad cop who's going to continue to supply Israel with weapons, ammunition, food, and other supplies. So that's, why, that's why I say it's political theater, because Net Netanyahu is not cowed by it at all. And he, he just makes it clear, you know, we've got the United States in our right hand pocket. And they're going to do what we want, not what we're not going to do what they want. We're going to pursue our own our own interests here. Do you think at the end of the day, Netanyahu would attack Rafa? I, no, I don't think so. I think they're getting ready to attack up, up north in Lebanon. You know, the Hezbollah has basically shut down the northern portion of Israel. Uh, so the, these uh, several of the settlements up north have had to be abandoned, uh, or the the inhabitants of those places have, have vacated them because it's too dangerous. 
So what uh, what you're seeing is uh, Israel talking about clearing out southern Lebanon up to the Latani River, and th therefore reasserting its control. But Hezbollah is not going to let them do that without a fight. And Hezbollah uh, has, in my in my view, a very formidable military organization. So it's a, it's, a, it's an army comparable in some some ways to uh, to the Israeli army, if not in, in some aspects better. But we'll see. Do you think that they're counting on the U.S. support when it comes to their <clears throat> confrontation with Hezbollah, or are they gonna do it on their own? Well, no, I think they're they're counting on U.S. support, and that and that's that's again problematic. The United States does not have an ample supply of 155 millimeter shells, with both Ukraine and Israel want it. So who's going to get it? Well, Israel's the favorite child. It'll get the larger portion, and if there are any leftovers, Ukraine may get some leftovers. Same for drones, same for actual artillery pieces, the howitzers, uh, same for tanks, same for planes, same for maintenance crews for all of those. So, you know, at some point we're going to see that there's like a reversal. Um, it's just, you know, this this is... This is not heading in a good direction, I guess is the best way to say it.